when I was putting it together. Uh, welcome, everyone. Glad you're here. Uh, welcome those on Zoom. I know we've got uh, uh, quite a few who are joining us on Zoom this morning, uh, and we appreciate that very much. I'm just kind of taking a, taking a look at around, taking stock. Who all's here? Have you ever said something you wished you could take back later? Anybody not ever say anything that they wanted to take back later? Have you ever written anything that you wished you could take back? That could be in a letter, that could be in an email, or in the most recent case with me, in a text, where something I said was not meant at least I didn't think so, in the way that it was in a group text, too. I love texting. Um, and it was taken in a manner that wasn't originally intended. I guess you can under, or, uh, realize just how that made me feel. And I've been thinking about this topic for quite some time. In fact, this this was actually uh, inspired by uh, an article by Gary Henry. I don't know if most of you know who Gary Henry is, but I think one of the books that, most prominent book that he's known or well known for uh, is Diligently Seeking God. But Gary Henry wrote this, uh, that was a couple paragraphs. Um, I can't even remember where, how I ran across it and where I ran across it, but it was about encouraging words. And uh, I, I started talking to Paul the other day, and, and we both have a file that, that we keep with sermon ideas. And uh, so I printed that off and stuck it in the file. And then in our First Thessalonians class, we've been talking, uh, dancing around this subject a little bit as well. In First Thessalonians 4 and verse 18, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be uh, reading from the New King James most of the morning, but this one I'm going to read from, from the English because I like how the English uh, translate it better. And it's very simple. It just says, therefore, encourage them with these words. Now, the words that he was talking about in that section has to do with the second coming. We know that. But Paul instructed them to encourage others with these words. Words should be encouraging, and that's what we're going to take a look at um, this morning, and hopefully um, Rob can eliminate it from his vocabulary. If you'd like to turn over to James chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 6, but in James 3, 5 and 6, it tells us there that the tongue is a devastatingly destructive instrument that is very difficult to control. How it reads, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. Encouraging words are not just limited to the spoken words, and corrupt words are not either. It can also include the written word, and we need to take that into account when we do that. In Ephesians 4, as Jason read, uh, read for us a little bit later, or a little bit earlier, excuse me, in Ephesians 4, verse 25, it says, Therefore, putting away all lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Now, a lot of people may uh, argue that how can all your words be encouraging if you're going to speak truth with your neighbor? And I know that there's a movie, uh, I can't remember how long ago, I think it was back in the 90s, that's um, a remake of Miracle on 34th Street. Towards the end of the movie, uh, the lawyer was asking or was saying to the judge, which is, which is uh, worse, a lie that brings a smile or a truth 
that brings a tear. So these are questions that we have to ponder. Naturally, in that, it was trying to imply that a tiny white lie isn't going to hurt. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Sometimes there's hard truths that need to be expressed. But what I want to focus on this morning is how we express them. How do we do that? In uh, a little bit down in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So there's two things that we know of that are from reading from here that aren't, that aren't good to have in our vocabulary, and that's corrupt words. Here's my favorite. flattering words. Now, I'm not talking about words that are spoken, spoken in, sincere, in sincerity, okay? What I'm talking about is uh, deceptive in nature, deceitful praise to win another's favor or to manipulate that individual. It's generally used when an individual is seeking to gain favor or when they're trying to push their own agenda. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, it reads, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are, for those who are such, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Over in 1 Thessalonians, where we've been studying for the last uh, few Wednesday nights, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Flattering words, although a lot of times um, there's a case for them uh, and it's appropriate, but oftentimes the flattering words are, are used to try to manipulate a situation. One of the things that I read on that is that flattering words is the favorite weapon of a harlot. So that hopefully puts that into perspective. But we don't always have to do harm if we choose. We can do great. We can do great good with the words that we say. So what I want to do for the remainder of our time this morning is take a look at some examples in the New Testament on how we can encourage one another with our words. Now, when it comes to encourage, uh, to define it, you can use inspire with courage, spirit, or hope. And then another word you can use in place of it is hearten. You can define it by an attempt to persuade with another word of urge. And then you can define it to spur on with another word of stimulate. These are all associated very closely with encourage. There's no better feeling than to know that others are thinking of us. There's no better feeling to know that others are thankful for us. We perform at the highest level when we know we are appreciated. So the first thing that we can do I'll pretend I asked that question. What are some of the encouraging, edifying, and refreshing words that we can speak? Words of gratitude. If you would, in 1 Thessalonians, again, in chapter 1, Paul wrote, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of of our God and Father. 
Who here has ever received uh, a compliment and not felt really good about it? Oftentimes I hear people uh, talking about how at work, they're just not appreciated at work. They go in for their performance review and they, and they never hear anything positive. It's natural to feel down when something like that happens. So imagine how it feels when you go into your performance review and you receive nothing but praise. You're, you're, what's the expression, dancing on air? Walking, anyway, dancing on air? You, uh, you're, you're euphoric. Imagine that is the way that we speak to one another all the time. When was the last time you told somebody you were thankful for them? Are you thankful for them? One of the things, and I know Paul and I mentioned this a couple times, is that it's oftentimes to get caught up, uh, it's, uh, we get caught up in just everything going along smooth and all of that. What about PJ? What about Nathan leading our singing here this morning? Steve leading the prayer for us this morning? Excellent, by the way, Steve. Thank you very much. And then Samuel as he prepared thoughts to help us as we remember our Lord's death this morning. When was the last time you said thank you? And I'm not asking you to say thank you if you don't mean it, because we don't want to go back to the, to the flattering words. But imagine and remember how good you feel when somebody tells you thank you. And then you know that they appreciate it. Turning over to 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20, Paul states again to the church at Thessalonica, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul always, you can just about see every letter that Paul wrote, that he expresses things. He expresses gratitude. You can also look at Romans 1.8, 1 Corinthians 1.4, Philippians 1.3, and Philemon verse 4. But not only are there words of gratitude, but there are words of confidence. We need to believe the best about one another and then express that sentiment. I know you can do it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. You don't need to turn over there. Hopefully we all, we all know pretty much what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. But verse 7 says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. The confidence that we have in our brethren is important. Just as Paul did but also, just as Paul did, we should be expressing that confidence. In Romans 15, verse 14, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And then once again in Philemon, in verse uh, 21 in Philemon, Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul expressed confidence in his brethren. But the writer of Hebrews did as well. In Hebrews 6, verse 9, this is not on the slide, it's not on the handout, but Hebrews 6, verse 9, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Encouraging words are important. Not every word out of our mouth has to be encouraging. Just 9.9 .9 out of 10. That would have saved me from embarrassment and humiliation in a text, and hopefully 
it can keep us out of similar situations. But along with gratitude and confidence, words that we can speak are words of hope. And there's two ways that we can do this, or two ways that this is done. When we, when we come in contact with people, we aren't always in contact with our brethren. We aren't always together. Wish we could be. But we can't. The majority of our time is spent with those outside of the church. And how we, how we speak greatly influences and has an influence on those outside the church. Amongst our brethren, hope, the hope in Christ is one of our most precious possessions. It's one of our most precious gifts. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's one of our greatest possessions. And I pray that we never lose it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, having the eyes of your, high, of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Oftentimes when I read this, sometimes I just skim right over it. It's something that I've heard and read so many times until this weekend. And I got to looking at it that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the hope? What are the riches? Let's encourage one another by reminding one another all the time of what those are. Having the thankfulness, having the confidence, and having the hope. But what about those that we come in contact with probably 70% of the time, maybe? Maybe more of those outside the church. In Colossians 4 and verse 6, it says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Then once again, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And here again, uh, I'm going to have to uh, bow to the English translation in this particular one. I kind of like it better than the New King James. The New King James uses meekness and fear. The English Standard uses gentleness and respect. Who doesn't want to be treated in a gentle man manner? Who doesn't want to be treated with respect? That's how we are to um, deal with those, all people that we come in contact with, but mainly those outside of the church Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope with gentleness and respect. We can do much good by building hope in others rather than quenching it. Words of love. When I first thought about this, it's like, okay, this is like me telling Dana all the time, I love you. Or when we go, and, and I know. Um, it's easy to talk about this, but it's also easy to lose sight of as well. 
and I hope I'm not the only one. But one of our routines when, when we're uh, first thing in the morning, uh, or if we're talking on the phone, or if I'm out of town and I call that evening, and it's always kind of like I always wait, kind of English like for her to go, love you, and then I go, love you too. Expressing words of love is very important. Very important. Stop and think about the love that was expressed to us and for us. The need to be loved is deep and it's strong. The Beatles said, all you need is love. And another song, and I can't remember the exact name of it, I just remember part of it is, um, and now it went poof. It'll come back. Words of love. We can't love God without loving his children. It's impossible to say that you love God and not love your brethren. Brothers and sisters. 1 John 4, verse 20. We'll continue just a couple verses through the fifth chapter in verse 2. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. All of us realize the importance of keeping God's commandments. But then I got to thinking to myself, when was the last time I told Samuel, hey, I love you, brother? When was the last time I told Randy, I love you, brother, and mean it, not do the love you, love you too type response? When was the last time? It's been a while for me. I know it happens a lot more amongst the ladies than it does the men. Men just don't do that. Real men of God do that. So, I'm not going to name you all individually. Everyone, I love you. And that's part of the reason why I'm standing here today is because of that. Don't be like me. No. <laughs> always be mindful. Always be conscious of the words that we speak. In Colossians 1, verse 4, Paul wrote, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints... Notice what Paul said here. He said, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, he again wrote, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Words that express our love can do much good that is simply immeasurable. It's incalculable. How did you pronounce that? Incalculable. This congregation has been very good in that regard. As I would mentioned earlier, there are numerous ways to encourage with words. You can use a spoken word. You can use the written word. You can send cards. Which are very well received. One of these I just received last week, week before. It brings a smile to my face and a tear to my eye. 
And every time that I think can't go on anymore, I pull out one of these cards and I take a look at it. And how that makes me feel, I cannot express. But I hope you know. So for those of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. One of the things about um, the things that we say, and we had read from Colossians uh, chapter 4 about having your, um, your speech seasoned with salt. And I'm not going to go into a big, long uh, explanation on what that is, so I'll give you the, the Rob uh, Cliff notes. Seasoned with salt is not just knowing what to say or when to say it, but more importantly, how to say it. There are times when a rough word is needed, but most times a soft, gentle, and respectful word works the best. Young children recognize the significance of expressive words. Would you believe that? Young children. I'm, spe I'm speaking specifically in the four to eight year old range, which I see numerous in the audience in that range. This I got from Ken Welliver's blog. Uh, it says, a few years ago, the New York Times, the online news source, uh, part of the New York Times, they published the results of this question. What does love mean? They posed that question. It was professionals who did it in human behavior. And they posed that question to a group of four to eight year olds. And they, you wouldn't think that they would know the value and the significance of expressing love. Billy, age four. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Chris, age seven. La uh, no, I don't want to go to that one yet. Noel, age seven. Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it all day. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is more handsome than Robert Redford. That was from Chris, age seven. Kids know the value and the significance of expressing encouraging words. And those words of gratitude, confidence, hope, and love. But one last thing before we uh, conclude here this morning. Again, I said, if, if, uh, I guess it reminded, if, if our words are seasoned with salt, then we will practice words. And now I want to turn over to the book of Proverbs. We're going to speak words that are pleasant. Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Not only are they going to be pleasant, remember we were talking about knowing what to say, when to say it? They're going to be well-timed. Proverbs 15, verse 23. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Also in Proverbs verse 25 and verse 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. But here's the one that gets me almost every time. Not only do they need to be pleasant, they need to be well-timed. They need to be well thought out. 
Proverbs 15, verse 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Whatever other abilities we may or may not have, we all can do good by the use of encouraging words. May our goal be to have a refreshing effect on all those we come in contact with. Now, what do you think of when you think of refresh or refreshing or refreshed? I'm trying to remember the name of the soft drink. I think it was Seven Up. About it being the, the refreshing drink. Kind of uh, maybe satisfy, but that really doesn't do justice to the word refresh. Refresh means to restore strength. Another word you can use is revive. Refresh means, as the ladies often say, freshen up. Renovate is another word you can use. Refresh can be restore by renewing, replenish. Or it can be to run water over or restore water to. Now, when you think of refreshing, Paul mentioned someone in particular. Back in the book of Philemon, verses 5 through 7, Paul said, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus, remember, your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. One of the blessings of us coming together like we have this morning is to be refreshed. Going back to Chris, age seven, when daddy is smelly and sweaty, what did daddy do? Come into the house, take a shower, change clothes. He refreshed. That's what we do when we come together, brethren. We are to build each other up, we are to admonish each other, and we are to refresh and be refreshed. In a passage that I know is a favorite to a lot of people on assembling, and yes, I'm going to go to it, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. I didn't want to go there yet. Give you a little bit of a sneak peek. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I'm going to skip verse 25, except for the last part of it. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm not going to use these words to uh, admonish the act of assembling. Admonish the I don't think I said that right. I'm not going to use these to promote the act of assembling, the necessity for the act of assembling. But let me ask you a question. With all that we've talked about here this morning, especially now about being refreshed, how are you going to do that if you don't assemble with your brethren? I know. 
all of you line up one by one and march one by one by my front door every Sunday or every day of the week so that I can be refreshed. We all know that that's, that's not going to happen. And that's, that's something that's, that you can't even ask people to do. So I'm going to ask you this. If we are to consider one another, and notice our theme is one another, but if we are to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, and then to exhort one another and to encourage one another as the day is coming, and there's an argument on what day is being talked about here, and we can argue that, but there is a day coming. And we're, when we're talking about that in First Thessalonians. But how are we going to do that if we don't assemble with our brethren? And I'm not talking just about in the church building. I'm talking about any time our brethren get together, my brethren, your brethren get together. It's impossible to do without it. The ultimate refreshing is expressed by our Lord and Savior. The ultimate refreshing. For those of you that didn't see the verse that was on the, on the overhead, can you think of how Jesus comforts us with those words? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the ultimate refresher. Has your heart been refreshed? Has your heart accepted Jesus? Do you need to be refreshed? Don't, don't, don't let it wait. There's a song that we sing today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. Listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whatever your case is this morning, if you need to be refreshed, please do so. Yet, today, while we stand and while we sing.